All right. Well, thank you for having me here. Uh, beautiful day, beautiful city. Um, having spent 11 years in England, I have never been to uh, Leicester. And uh, I had the pleasure of finding Stefania here, former student of mine, and finding Richard III. So um, anyway, I'm going to talk about a research journey uh, that started quite a while ago. Um, in fact, uh, I don't want to think about it, but um, yes, um, if you, oh my God, there is something wrong with my computer. Okay, uh, uh, yeah, the, the page down doesn't work. Um, anyway. If you walk into the Modern Museum of Art in New York, uh, on a wall, there is this huge mural on a white wall of all the people, all the artists involved in uh, the invention of abstract art between 1910 and 1925. And um, if you zoom in, you will see some of the key individuals who were involved, in particular Kandinsky, Picasso, Apollinaire. Um, what does the diagram say and how do you read it? As you read on the MoMA website, uh, the diagram talks about actors, artists who played a significant role in the development of a new modern language of the abstract arts. And it talks about relationship. relationships and connections among these artists and whose acquaintance with one another during these years, 1910-1925, could be documented. The names in red are those with the most connections within this group. I highlighted some of them. Um, actors have been a concern of mine for a long time, uh, since certainly the uh, early 1980s, but in a book that I published in 2004, From Words to Numbers, there is an early section uh, titled It Takes Two to Tango in Search of the Actors that starts. In the early 1980s, by the end of my dissertation work, an econometric analysis of official strike statistics in the Italian post-war period, I had come to a depressing conclusion. Quantitative strike research had produced an abundant literature in its 100 years of history, give or take a few years or decades. But, and the but was that the actors had disappeared behind uh, econometric and statistical coefficients in general. Uh, where were the workers, the unions, the employers, the state? There was nothing of the sort and of their relationship. I was at the University of Michigan at the time in 1981, where a lot of people were, as a postdoc, and a lot of people were using newspapers as sources of socio-historical data and content analysis as a way of extracting information from the papers. And uh, Charles Tilly, Bill Gamson, Page. Um, and I decided, in my enthusiasm and uncharacteristics, uh, lack of realism, that I could, having had a computer uh, background and a, uh, a statistical background that I could crack the problem of using a better method of extracting information from newspapers in no time. As you can tell, this is 2015. I'm still <laughs> trying to solve that problem. Uh, so be careful about having brilliant ideas. Um, what I did come up in the end by 1985 was what I would later discover to be a story grammar. Basically, the five W's of journalism, who, what, when, where, why, and how, or subject, verb, object, and their characteristics, in particular time and space. Those are the fundamental categories of narrative, time and space. And um, at the time, I thought I had developed something terribly new. In reality, these five W's of journalism were there even in uh, classical rhetoric, in Latin, the quis quid cur quomo de quando quibus auxilis, but certainly by 1560, when Thomas Wilson writes one of the first books in the vernacular language on rhetoric, the art of rhetoric, he talks about 
the who, the what, the where, the what, the where, etc. Right? The five W's of journalism and age. Um, so, given that this thing was there, it's called the theory of circumstances uh, in classical rhetoric. So, given that that had been there for two thousand years, where were my innovation? Well. I use the story grammars, these five W's of journalism, with the addition of transformational syntax rewrite rules, so that I could express the relationship between objects in a very tight way. For computer scientists, that would be the Bacchus-Nauer form, the rewriting re re of something on the left-hand side with something on the right-hand side through a set of relationships, so that in the end you can relate anything to anything else. Then I put this uh, structure of narrative into a relational database management system uh, and developed the software to do it, PCAs, Program for Computer Assisted Coding of, the, of Events. That has been the bane of my life, this program. Um, and uh, third, I, because I wanted to do uh, more uh, slightly larger scale uh, social historical project that I couldn't do on paper, so I needed a database system. The third thing, thing that I did was apply methods of data analysis and data visualization to the kind of data that I had collected. But the reality is, where is my innovation? Those story grammars had been there for 2,000 years. Relational database management system had been developed for a few decades by people like Nello. Uh, computer scientists, in other words, methods of data analysis, statistical techniques were there. So I did nothing but putting together things that, that were there before. But on the other hand, the father of Nello science, that is Shannon, um, who is the father of information theory, uh, had done a BA in mathematics at MIT and uh, then a, an MA in electrical engineering at MIT, and this is the last page of his master thesis. This is a masterpiece. On the top, there is a mathematical equation based on Boolean algebra, which he had learned in his BA, and at the bottom, there are electrical relay switches, which he had learned during his MA in electrical engineering. He put two things together that he did not invent that he did not develop, someone else did, Boolean algebra had been there for a couple of hundred years, I suppose, and electrical uh, switches had been there at least since the beginning of the 1900. Uh, and, um, but the zero-one equations, you know, introduced a new way of conceiving uh, uh, a completely new science he introduced. So, when we think about the innovation, uh, yeah, I, I think that he's basically putting together things in a relational way. So I applied Q&A, this technique that I now call quantitative narrative analysis, and PCA is the program, for two projects, the rise of Italian fascism, 1919-22, and lynchings in Georgia, 1875-1930. Both projects are based on newspapers. Um, some, uh, only four newspapers for the Italian fascism, but a huge project of some 300,000 subject, action, object thing. The lynchings of Georgia uh, is about um, uh, 1,300 newspapers, uh, but 7,000 SVO uh, structures. My data look like this. In red are the words coming from newspapers using the language of the time, and in white are the categories of my story grammar. So I just read the stuff in red, and it reads as, as a narrative. Negro attacks from behind October, on October 14, 1896, uh, a woman who is single, her name is Blanche Gay, uh, Gray, near Griffin, in the woods. The Negro chokes the woman, and the Negro rapes the woman. Just for your information, some 200, about half of the 500 or so lynchings in Georgia in that period involved violations of gender norms between black men and white women. Uh, but rape could mean 
anything and even looking at a woman could be considered rape because the statute of the laws of Georgia say that rape does not involve physical contact. So looking at a white woman could be considered rape. Um, so the question back in the 1980s certainly was what can you do with this data? Well, back in the 1980s and early 90s, my thought was what you can do with this data, you count the, the numbers, you put the numbers in relation to each other, given the uh, use of uh, rewrite rules, so I can put any object in relation to other object, count them, and then apply traditional techniques of statistical analysis, like logistic regression. This is what I claim in a paper that I published in Sociological Methodology in 94. In reality, you can do much more with this data in terms of particularly data visualization. This is a network model. It's a model similar to the one that you can see on the walls of the, uh, of the MoMA. Um, and it's a network of fascist relationship. The difference between this and the MoMA is that the MoMA doesn't have the arrow uh, showing who is relating to whom. Because <clears throat> the MoMA was only interested in saying not who writes more to whom, who collaborates more with whom, but do they collaborate, period. Um, here I was interested in, in the violence, so these there are actions of violence, kill, wound, kick, punch, etc. Um, and what you can see is that the fascists came to power with in, at the end of 1922 in October w after unprecedented level of violence against the left. Trade union, workers, protesters, communists, uh, socialists, and the police did the same and the police let the fascists do it without much interference. Um, we will come back to this slide and show how somewhat misleading it is. But what you can do as well is uh, geographic information system uh, mapping. That is, you can map the time and space and actions, right? The fundamental categories of narrative. What this show is actions of conflict in 1919-1920 by workers. 1919-1920 are known by, Itali by historians as the Red Years. Much of the local history has been done, in fact, by British historians, Snowden, Corner. Um, and uh, on top of that, then you put the actions of violence by the fascists in 1921-22, also known as the Black Years. What you can see is that the hot, so this is, uh, uh, this type of map is called the heat map. It shows the hot points between uh, the two and the, the regions or the areas where there is a lot of, where there is heat, there is overlap between fascist violence and uh, uh, socialist um, um, uh, movements in, during the Red Years. It's Campania, Puglia, Lazio, Toscana, Emilia Romagna, Lombardy, which are exactly what the Italian histor or what the historians of local situation had shown. So at least I knew that I had not um, misrepresented history. Another thing that you can do nowadays is you take the words and you put them in Wordle or TechCrowd or some of these programs, and what it shows is the size of the words depends upon its frequency and the colors are random and you can randomize the colors. So here is all the word of actors and actions. The Negro stands out, uh, of course. These are only the actions. And the action, there is a lot of actions of violence and then actions of movement. Uh, went, uh, ran away, etc. And I just want to point out that what this has changed uh, the representation of my sociological methodology paper to numbers and nothing else to colors and shape, right? Um, they, they are colorful and they're different shapes. Uh, this idea of playing with words has a long history. Um, 
So back to Wilson, you can see that many books in the early 1500 um, concluded with this triangular play of words uh, in another treatise of rhetoric of the same period, another Englishman, there is a treble triangle in the end, okay? So this play with words is, has also a long history. But look at Apollinaire, one of the guys who stood on the wall of the MoMA, um, he writes these poems, the calligram, and he disposes the words in ways that he makes a picture, particularly like this one, because it says, reconnais-toi, uh, cette adorable personne, c'est toi. Uh, recognize yourself, this adorable person, it's you. So I'm glad he says that. Um, or another play with words, which uh, is Paris, uh, again by Apollinaire. But perhaps the most famous one of them all is Robert Indiana's uh, lithograph, Love. He played with it between 1958 and 64. By 64, it had become... Uh, an immediate success because the United States Post Office made a stamp out of this particular representation of love, okay? Um, so, but these are static representations. Beautiful as they are, there is color, there is shape, but they're static. The innovation of digital scholarship was to add yet another element to this idea of static representation. And so let's go back to Kandinsky. So if I go over it, you can see that this thing comes alive, right? There is our uh, Kandinsky, here is Apollinaire, um, the guy who was so impressed with me, uh, saying that the cute guy was me. Here is Kandinsky. But what the web allows you to do is you click on something and then you get all that information. You get pictures of him, you get his biography, you get information about... Uh, so there is a connection between the macro and the micro. So you have this big picture, the macro picture of all this relationship. You click on one of them and uh, you get the micro. Thank you. Okay, this again is the representation that we saw before, right? We um, but I want to show you what happened if I do a dynamic model over time and as it changes over time. Hmm. So this basically what I am going to do, I'm going to look at history through a tiny window of just a few months, a couple of months at a time. So in front of you, you will see many actors appear and disappear as history goes by through this little window. Okay? Um, these are called dynamic network models. And I want you to pay attention to this relationship between police coming down and then the fascist uh, and how it changes between the red years of 1919-1920 and the black years of 21-22. And it comes uh, all of a sudden by the end of 1920 when the, uh, after the factory occupation movement. Nearly uh, the Italian left had uh, made a revolution, but okay, just watch. The red years, the police beating up everybody on the left. All of a sudden, by the end of 1920, the fascists come into the, into the face of history, beating up the same people that the, that the police had been beating up for the first two years, and the police disappearing. The Italian state has a great responsibility for 20 years of dictatorship in Italy. Um, but there is another... Okay, am I here? Yes. If we look at the relationship of lynching, the network models of lynching, um, my hunch was that the relationship of violence between 
the Negro and white women, that is those half of the lynchings uh, that we have uh, registered, did not occur until maybe the end of the 1800, that is then the full implementation of the Jim Crow laws, that is complete segregation of everything. Um, of course, the relationship of violence between the mob and the Negro is always there because if there is no mob, there is no lynching, right? But again, we have, how do I, where is my mouse to? Ah, okay, there it is. So I enable again the timeline. We, because here we are dealing with many years, uh, the aggregation is by years. And now I wanted to watch what is happening. If I am right, well, you already see that in 1875 the relationship is there. But that relationship of violence between black men and white women, according to Southern, uh, newspapers, most of them are southern newspaper, never disappears. Okay? Just watch. Many actors come and go. But this relationship hardly ever disappears. So, what this new kind of scholarship allows us to do, it has added to color and shape, it has added color, shape, and movement. Things are now moving and they're moving in history. Okay, ah. How am I? Is it on the web? Okay, great. Um, this is a website. Um, I won an award on digital humanities, digital scholarship uh, by the Mellon Foundation. And uh, although we are now changing uh, the website, but um, so this is a prototype, but it, it shows what you can do with this data. So I am here. Oops. And I am moving along here, okay? I am moving in history, and as I move in history, these little um, icons appear. They are lynchings that happen somewhere. This is a map of Georgia, and uh, I move on, move on, and uh, I can take any of them, click on them, ah! Lynching of Goolsby in 1901, it happened there, view more. I can get a lot of things, including the newspaper articles themselves, okay, the original PDF articles. So again, this has allowed us to go from the macro to the micro and uh, representing color, shape, movement, okay. This is Google Earth on the rise of Italian fascism, 1919, 1922. Okay, he's, he's loading up. Here we go. Yeah, thank you. Again, it knows that it's a timeline. Um, and noticed again the color, the shape. We all recognize Italy uh, and movement. Uh, Google Earth is very slow, um, but I wanted to show you something. I should have gone there because that's Nello's uh, region and it would give me the same result. Uh, not as dramatic as I will show you in Rome, uh, but I think Nello would have appreciated it. It's supposed to zoom in, but it's uh, very, very slow. Okay, zooming in. Now, I want you to pay close attention for one second. Look at this. Ah. 
Okay, that's like a wow moment, right? You look at this. These are all actions of violence and of conflict. The red ones are the socialists or others, and the, the one, these icons in black and white are fascist. I can zoom into one of them. Look at this one, let's see what happened. Ah, Roma, fascist, it's an action of violence in 130, 1921, okay? Um, so colors, shape, and movement, but that sort of wow moment when this thing comes alive. And to me, that was, so how do I get back to my thing? I'll go, oh, here I am. Wow, lucky this time. Um, and um, to me, when I first saw it was, it took me a while. I was thinking, my God, what, how do I react to this? And I thought, fireworks. This is what it reminds me of. And then I started doing research on fireworks. And I discovered this guy from Siena, Vanoccio Biringuccio, who writes one of the first books on fireworks, De la Pyrotechnia. In fact, he didn't care about fireworks. He was a man of war. He wanted to use the new gunpowder to wage war, right? And um, he was a man of action. Uh, he was an alchemist, obviously. He was one of the first transgressors of the alchemist tradition of not saying anything about what you found out. And he writes this book on 10 books, and on the very last, on 10 chapters, basically. On the very last chapter, on chapter 10, he has a couple of pages on a new use of firework, of gunpowder for, del for the enjoyment of people. Fireworks. To Biringucho, this is a complete waste of money because they last less than a kiss with a beautiful woman. These are his words, right? And uh, he... Uh, but he uses the word beautiful and beauty many times throughout those two pages. So he must have been quite impressed, impressed to the point that he himself did the drawing of the most famous fireworks of the time, La Girandola, which were in Castel Sant'Angelo in Rome, in the Vatican. Um, well, not many people would have rushed <laughs> to see the Girandola on the basis of these paintings, but many artists throughout the centuries painted La Girandola. This, this is one about the same time in the 1500, late 1500. Another one by an English painter at the end of the 1700. Um, but with the same characteristics of this movement of colors, this wow moment, right? But the other thought that I had was peacocks. Was, and in fact, if you look on the web, there are some... Um, YouTube representation of someone, there is a woman, uh, and then waiting, waiting, waiting for the bloody peacock to extend his tail. And finally, when he does, she goes, wow, it's that wow moment. So again, I started looking at representations of peacocks, and perhaps the most amazing one is by Conrad Gesner's The Historia Animalium, published in Zurich in 1555, probably the most uh, important naturalist of the 16th century. Um, and he dedicates several pages to the peacock where he provides summaries of what people from, from uh, Livio to others through history thought of the peacock. And they all describe it as beautiful. Well, but Darwin, <laughs> to the, in a letter to a friend, says, the sight of a peacock tail truly makes me sick. And the reason being that if you have a theory that claims that the survival of the fittest was the basis of uh, uh, evolution, uh, you have a problem. As one of the modern historians of science says, here you have a guy who needs to support a wife, children, and a huge tail, right? So uh, Darwin eventually changed the theory of the survival of the fittest to the sexual selection, right? Um, so, back to Kandinsky. Back to his book Concerning the Spiritual in Art, written in 1911, uh, and this idea of beauty. Beauty as color, as shape, and movement. Kandinsky fundamentally thought that these three characteristics are the basis of 
our idea of beauty. But so when I went in search of the actors in early 1980s, in 1981 in fact, uh, I did find the actors. We saw the Negro, the woman, the mob. We saw the fascists, the police, the, uh, the workers, the communists. So I did find them. But I also found other actors. For instance, I found Prop, who developed this idea the mod among the modern scholars uh, who developed the, the idea that there is a structure in narrative. Vygotsky, who also studied uh, with the Russian formalists, as they are called. And Vygotsky added another idea to the idea of uh, narrative, the idea of beauty. And he asked himself, why did Bunin eventually end up getting the first Nobel Prize in Soviet history in 1938, be, be, beyond? But why was he such an effective writer? And what Vygotsky claimed is that he was able to take the narrative structure of one thing after the other, reconvert it into what is called the plot, that is mixing it up for a rhetorical reason, and then using rhetorical devices such as uh, the so-called uh, re uh, descriptive rewriting, or where you take a light, a heavy thing and you make light, or a dark thing and you make light. So Bunin, um, that's how he, he was writing. And Vygotsky uh, adds to this idea that there is a structure, the idea of beauty. To me, despite, the, of course, there is no relation between Prop and Kandinsky, but to me, I've been trying for months to find a relationship between these two guys. For at least a year, I've been working on it. Um, of, they both studied at the University of Moscow. Um, you know, they come many, many years apart. But Vygotsky, after working on narrative, finally starts writing about art. And uh, he was very impressed with revolutionary art, um, Soviet revolutionary art. He never, never mentioned Kandinsky. Kandinsky was a conservative. He came back to Moscow in the 30s. He left never to come back again. And the question is, why didn't Vygotsky ever mention Kandinsky? To me, I find this fascinating, and I'm not going to rest until I find that relationship. But these tiny relationships of words is what have gotten me into many innovative points. Even the lack of words have given me new ideas. So in 2011, I see this article that talks about the lynching of Ike Redney in 1918, again for the rape, alleged rape of a woman. But the name of a woman has been taken out. We have about, out of the 200 and some, 230 stories of lynching involving women as, uh, as um, target, um, we have about 150 of them that provides names. And this was taken out. And my question was, why? And my southern friends tell me, because she is toast. She's a disgrace to herself and others. She better get out of town. So, name taken out. Another, uh, so that led me to asking myself, is she really toast? What happened to these women? And one of the women I first investigated, Annie Laurie Poole, she was allegedly raped by Floyd Carmichael in 1906 in Atlanta. And uh, that event, along with other lynching, along with other events of uh, alleged rape, which were never mentioned, but her name was at least mentioned in the newspapers, led to the 1906 Atlanta race riots where 23 black men and black people left their life to the hands of, ramp of whites in a rampage, okay? Well, so this is the first woman I investigate, Annie Laurie Poole, and what do I find out? There she is in the 1910 census records. You can see she was born in 1891, so in 1906 she was 15. Her uh, sister, Tommy, they uh, write it down as son, because Tommy, and then they correct it, daughter, okay? We find her again in 1910, 
with the same mistake for a tummy. So this is probably another census recorder who makes the same mistake because they record, they ask, okay, who is it? Oh, tummy. Oh, son. Oh, no, it's a daughter. Oh, okay. But you can see another mistake. Um, yeah, same mistake for Tommy, wrote down as Thomas. Um, and uh, she is 15 in 1910, so they get the date wrong. This is typical of the census records, all the records. To do this kind of research is very painful. And then she disappears. We don't find her again in 1920, 1930. She did move out of town then, probably. No. In 1910, we find her marriage certificate. She married a guy named Lucien Thomas Pope, who then we discover in the census record. He died in 1917. Bloody hell, she marries again in 1923. With two children, an alleged rape, she marries twice. And I think, well, she wasn't so toast. And in fact, some of the women who I was told by friends who were married at the time of the alleged rape, oh, the husband will either divorce her or never touch her again, but they had children. We find them in the census record with children after the rape. For this woman, we found the uh, tombstone. As you can see, even on the tombstone, they misspelled a last name, Poole. I did get in touch with one of her uh, great grand uh, said, oh yeah, that was a mistake. Uh, so it's not just the census record, but even... Did she marry twice because she's consistently described, even by the Washington Post, as beautiful? In some other representation, they say she's beautiful with beautiful hair. Um, yes. Um, another play with words led me to the discovery that the Emory's mascot, this guy named Dooley, is actually a skeleton. And when I first went to Emory in 206, during uh, Dooley's week, they would hang the skeletons on the trees, on the main quad. Uh, it reminded me of these words made famous by Billie Holiday, Southern trees bear strange fruit, blood on the leaves and blood at the root. Black bodies swinging in the southern breeze, pastoral scene of the gallant south. Okay? Um, but how did I get to this? One of the 1300 newspaper articles that we have on lynching, the lynching of John Cumming in 1904 ends with these words, this is the penalty for rape, yours truly, Brother Dooley, pinned to the body of the guy who was lynched, left on, uh, on a tree. I went there, I saw the tree, the tree is still standing there, huge oak tree. And it has taken years of research, but we did pin it down, we have found the connection between the two events following these words. So, of words and their relationship, the last thing of following words, I gave a talk at American University in 2013 in Washington, D.C., and uncharacteristically, they changed the title of my talk. <laughs> that never happened before. They changed the title of my talk, which was From Words to Numbers, following many of my publications, to From Words to Visuals. That was my luck. Because that, I, it made me think, this is exactly what I'm doing. This has changed the, the nature of my work. And so behind this work, there is a lot of technical apparatus. This is a child game with what Nello would play with, talking about technical apparatus, but leading to visual representations, leading to this idea of beauty. Quite different from the representation of the 1994 sociological methodology paper. So, is it a rapprochement between these two cultures, what C.P. Snows calls the two cultures of the divided words of science and the humanities? Is it leading to a rapprochement of the two? So, the story point. The digital word leads to innovation. It's a game changer in scholarship. In the way we think of scholarship now, the question is, what will you do from now on in our publication? Just publish websites? 
maybe. You know, I've been working on this website for some years on the lynching thing, and because of its potential controversy, uh, it's uh, and problems with the data. Um, second, outliers. I have followed outliers. The brother Dooley, the erased woman's name. Outliers is leading to innovation. In statistical work, we throw out the outliers. Finally, a change in word leads to new word. You know, that it just opens up a completely new word. And relationships are the road to innovation. So it was for Shannon, relating uh, linear algebra or Boolean algebra with uh, relay, electrical relay switch. It was from Indi for Indiana. For Indiana, the word love was there. The L-O-V-E, the characters were there. The colors he used were there. He just put them together in a different way. As for Franzosi, well. Um, and with a little bit of luck in those relationships, you may even find love. For as hard as I tried to find love in those stories of lynchings, I didn't find any. I didn't find any because these stories are stories written by uh, white uh, editors uh, for white, probably white supremacist papers. So the possibility that there would be love between these two individuals, it wasn't there. And even if it was there, the woman cried rape when caught. Do white, southern white women have a responsibility for some of this lynching? Well, we, we do not know. But I tried very hard to see if there was a story of love. Only in one story, the paper does say, rumors in town says that she was just as guilty as he was, but he ended up lynched, right? Meaning maybe it was a consensual story. And that's the end of my story. Right. Thank you.